So today, we're going to talk about something called drug addiction. And I'm hoping by the end of the talk, you guys are going to walk away maybe knowing something you didn't know when you came in, OK? Start off by asking a very simple question. How many people had dinner yet? Did you guys eat? How many people didn't eat? How many people are really hungry? OK. I was just curious, so OK. Um, oh, I didn't, OK, so. They were supposed to wait for me to ask for the slide. He put it up already. That's OK. All right. Um, so if you can just wait for me to ask for the slides, that'd be great. So before we get started, I want you guys to look at these two pictures. Let's start with the first picture. What are your thoughts about that? Does anyone have a thought on the first picture? What's kind of the first thing that comes to mind? You don't have to raise your hand. Just go ahead and speak. Yummy. Yummy. OK. Filling, okay. Yummy, filling. What else? Fattening. Fattening, okay. Cavities, okay. What about the second picture? Cheese. Cheese. Carbs. Carbs, fattening. Yum. <laughs> Yum, okay. Delicious, okay. Let me ask you something. If you had this in front of you, let's, we're going to go with the first one. If you had the first thing in front of you, do you think you'd eat it? Okay. Do you think you would take one bite or do you think you would take two? Fair enough. Let's look at the second one. Let's say, for those of you that didn't have dinner yet, that it's time for dinner, you want to have a piece of pizza. How many of you eat one piece of pizza? Well, I've been alive for, well, I've been alive a long time. So. The thing I'll tell you is, throughout my lifetime, I have never, ever sat down and ate one piece of pizza. I always go for that second one, okay? Can I have the next slide, please? Okay. We're gonna go with the first picture on top. Does anyone have any initial thoughts about that? What was that, I'm sorry? A, a treat, anyone else? Nutritious? What? Healthy. What about the second picture? Our mind is going to react to things that we find satisfying and that we find rewarding. Okay? So I want you to keep that in mind. The difference in the way that you reacted to the picture, the ice cream and the pizza, versus the way you reacted to the broccoli and the peas. Because there is a difference. Can I have the next slide, please? Does anyone know who this is? Extra credit points. Nobody knows who it is? Okay. This gentleman's name is Dr. William Halstead. Is anyone here in medicine or is interested in going into medicine? Okay. William Halstead was one of the founders of Johns Hopkins University. Has anyone here not heard of Johns Hopkins University? For those of you that haven't, Johns Hopkins University is one of the premier medical institutions in this country. They're known for premier medical care. The best researchers in the world go there. The best researchers have trained there, okay? Dr. Halstead pioneered what is called aseptic techniques during surgery. What that means is, is that performing surgery while making sure that your hands were clean and there weren't any bacteria. I mean, now we think of it as that's just common practice, right? But back in the time when he was practicing, they didn't know about bacteria, but this guy knew about it. So he pioneered clean surgical procedures and he was one of the founders of one of the most prominent institutions in this country. Can I have the next slide, please? So we have here, he was one of the founders of Johns Hopkins Hospital. He was a pioneering surgeon. Just like I told you, he developed aseptic techniques for surgical, but this man struggled with severe drug addiction. Okay, can I have the next slide? This is written, this was a biography about him for somebody that knew him. And in the first, I didn't put the first part of this, but the first part of this basically states what an amazing man he is, what an accomplished surgeon he was, and what just an amazing doctor he was. But let me read what this says. Halstead the addict was a mess. He would disappear for long stretches. The summer vacations would routinely last five months. No one knew quite where he went. His behavior was erratic. Friends and colleagues and patients, one moment and hostile the next, okay? He would bow out of operations at the last minute, and his residents, those are the people that would train with him, pretty much ran his services without him. The professor was often missing in action, okay? 
pardon me, so the, way I, the reason why I bring this up is to just show you the power of what happens when people are afflicted with this illness. And it is an illness, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Can I have the next slide, please? So we're going to go through some questions. I know, I'm sorry, school hasn't started yet, but did you guys have the Scamtrons? They were handed out up front. You got a number two pencil? No? Okay. So here, which of the following best describes drug addiction? So one, is a character flaw and a personal choice? B, can often be healed without treatment? C, is a disorder of the central nervous system? Or D, only, uh, only is acquired through poor social interactions? How many think A? How many think B? How many think C? How many think D? How many aren't listening and are looking at their watch every five minutes waiting to leave? No? Okay, good. Okay. I was, I was, I was wondering if someone was going to raise their hand. Um, the correct answer is C. Okay? Um, so C, so addiction is characterized by a disorder that uh, affects, affects the central nervous system. Can I have the next slide, please? Another question. Which of the following are addictive? Meaning, which of the following can you have a drug addiction to? Hookah is A, prescription painkillers, marijuana, all of the above, none of the above. How many say A? How many say B, C, D, or E? The answer is D. Very good. Can we have the next one? Don't, th there's, there's only 26 questions, so we got 24 more left. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is actually the last one. So which of the following is true? Doctors prescribe medications that are addicting. B, a person can die from medicines prescribed by their doctor. C, doctors in general lack sufficient knowledge about addiction. D, some doctors function as drug dealers to their patients. And E, all of the above are true. For the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you the answer to this question is E. So all of those statements are true. Okay? And I'll be happy to answer any questions as we go along. Can I have the next slide, please? So when we talk about addiction, what is it? So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is that we're going to talk about what this is. Okay, so addiction, as I said here in the PowerPoint, uh, it's an illness that, you know, we have, it, it has a biological basis, meaning that there is biology behind it, meaning that there are reasons why people are afflicted by these behaviors. It can be life-threatening, meaning that this is something if somebody has the illness that can actually take their life from them. And it can cause significant emotional and psychological problems. And when a, somebody has this problem, they will try and hide it from those that care about them and for those that are treating them. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, we're going to skip that. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay. So when we talk about drug addiction, we often talk about the four C's. So for people that are interested in kind of understanding this a little bit, think of what it is. So we're going to go through the four C's. So the first C for people that have drug addiction is loss of control. So what does that mean? It means that the individual has lost their ability to control their use of drug X. So somebody pick a drug that you know is addictive. Heroin. Heroin. So if somebody has a heroin addiction and they're using heroin, they have lost their ability to control that use. Okay? And the reason why I'm spending time on this, I want you to think about that. They have lost their ability to control their utilization of that drug. Think about it. You have a behavior that you engage in, but you can't control it. It controls you. Okay? Compulsive use. Does anyone want to take a stab on what compulsive use means? It means you do it over, over, and over again. Okay? You're, it's done compulsively, and you can't stop. Use despite consequences. Okay? So some more audience participation. Does anyone want to share what maybe that means? Yes. That's exactly right. Does anyone have another example of what that might mean? Of what that may mean? Yes. Right. So let me. Why don't I give an example? Let's say you have somebody that is utilizing alcohol, and alcohol is bad for you. 
and the person goes to their doctor and the doctor tells them, they say, you know, Mr. Jones, your alcohol use is really causing damage to your liver. In fact, we think you might have cirrhosis, which is a bad liver disease, and you really need to stop drinking. So the person knows that the alcohol use is causing cirrhosis, but they can't stop. So they know that their utilization or their use of this drug is causing them to become ill, but even despite that knowledge, they cannot stop. Okay, so this is what we mean by use despite adverse consequences. The last thing here is craving. So what does craving mean? Craving is basically what I showed you in the first slide, meaning that when you saw the picture of the ice cream sundae and you saw the picture of the pizza, for those of you that didn't eat dinner, you were craving that. I'll be honest with you, I ate dinner and I was craving it, okay? So when you see something like that, when we, when we talk about drug craving, whether it's for alcohol or whether it's for other drugs, there's something called drug craving, and it's very similar to hunger, to hunger and thirst. When you're fasting and it's a hot summer day like we had during this, during this last holy month of Ramadan at the end of the month, or excuse me, at the end of the day, you're thirsty, you're craving water, you're craving that beverage, you're hungry, you're craving food you want to eat, okay? For people that suffer with drug addiction, they experience the same thing except they're craving whatever drug they're using. So it could be alcohol, it could be heroin, it could be marijuana, it could be something else. So, the reason why I go over this is just to give you a general idea of what it is. So this is just a very, um, kind of the core concept of what this illness is, okay? Does anyone have any questions before we go on? No, okay. Next slide, please. Some statistics for you. So 23.5 million persons ages 12 or older needed treatment for illegal drug use and alcohol problems in 2009. That's 9.3% of the U.S. population. That's one in 10. Okay, that's a lot. One in 10 people in this country suffer with this illness. That's huge. How many of those people get treatment? Not a lot. So if we look at those that get treatment, only 2.6 million or only 11.2% of the 9.3% actually got into a treatment program. Next slide. So what I want to talk about now is things that are called painkillers. Um, so when we're in pain, our doctors often prescribe painkillers. And these are often called opiates or opioids. And I'm going to throw out some common names. These can include things that are known as morphine or Vicodin or Norco. Okay. And what this little chart is showing you it's showing you how much pain medicine has been prescribed in this country over the years. So let's take a look at back here in 1997, the year I was born. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so you see a pretty dramatic increase in the amount of pain medicine that's been prescribed in this country over the last 20 years. It's very concerning because pain medicines are very addictive. Now, it's beyond the scope of this talk of why this increase has happened, but it's important for you to know that there's a huge increase in pain medicine prescribing in this country. And this is a United States thing. If you look at the way that pain is managed in other parts of the country, it's completely different. Excuse me, in other parts of the world, it's completely different. The United States is something like 15% of the world's population, but we utilize 80% of the world's supply of pain medicine, okay? The way we treat pain here in this country is we give morphine and Vicodin. If you go to China, you go to France, you go somewhere else, it's completely different. So it's a problem we have here and we have to deal with it. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide. Don't make me come over there and do it myself. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, so the other thing that, oh, this is on tape, isn't it? Crap. Okay. Um, th the next thing that we want to look at is the rates of overdose and death. Because something I need to tell you is that the pain medicines, although they're very good at treating your pain, and they can certainly make pain go away, but the unfortunate thing is if you use too much of it, they can kill you. If you use too much of it, you're going to shut down your breathing. You're going to go to sleep and you're not going to wake up. So remember those four C's that I showed you? If you have somebody that's using morphine or Norco or Vicodin, they're using those in a compulsive way, 
they can't control it, they're having craving, they take more than they can, what's going to happen? They're going to overdose and they're going to die. Look at what's happening if we go from 1971 all the way through 2000, and this is nine years old. Trust me, the graph is still going up. Look at the number of deaths that have happened. Look at how this is dramatically increasing. This is now a national epidemic. The number of deaths related to pain medicine overdose is something, it's over 15,000 annually. It's huge. Okay, between 15 and 20,000 a year. Do the math. That's over 1,000 per month. Okay, so this is a huge problem, and this is why we're talking about it today. Because I need to share with you, our community is not immune to this. Uh, this is affecting our country. It's affecting our country. It's affecting our community, and we need to talk about it. Right? Because if somebody is struggling with this, we want to help them. I don't want anyone here in this room or anyone in your family to be one of these statistics. So we're talking about it, and we're going to talk about it more and more and more until the community becomes comfortable talking about it. And even then, we're going to talk about it even more. Okay? Next slide. Next slide. Okay. So the thing I want to talk about, just to help you understand drug addiction a little bit better, is that let's talk about natural rewards, okay? So these are reward, remember I said that, you remember one of the questions? I said that addiction was a disease that affects the central nervous system, right? Do you remember that? For those of you that aren't on your smartphones? Okay. So the reason why that happens is we have something in our mind that's responsible for processing natural rewards. What are natural rewards? Food, water, intimacy, and nurturing. These are all very pleasurable for us. So we have a circuit in our brain that allows us to, uh, that allows us to experience pleasure, right? For people that have drug addiction, there's something going wrong in that area, and they experience the same pleasurable sensations from a drug, but on exponent, but on a much greater scale that's exponentially greater. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, I drew this last night. I hope it's okay. Um, I'm just kidding. I got it off the internet. Uh, but this shows you, again, the names aren't important, but the reason why I'm showing this to you is just to illustrate, is to show you that th this is your brain. So if I take your brain and if I cut it in half and we look at it from like a side profile, this is basically what it is. So those areas that I'm talking about, this is what's responsible for what we call the reward pathway that's responsible for giving you pleasure. And when we're working with chemical substances that cause addiction, this is what's involved. This is why I told you earlier that this is a problem that affects the central nervous system, and your brain is part of that. The next slide, please. Okay. What is addictive? So these are the drugs that the most common ones that are addictive. Let's go over them, shall we? We have opiates or painkillers. These include things like heroin, morphine, uh, something called hydrocodone, which is Vicodin and others, okay? We have sedatives that are used to sedate people. Uh, these include things like Valium, Xanax, Ativan and another medicine called clonopin. We have things that are called stimulants. These are commonly prescribed medicines like Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta. We have obviously alcohol. We have nicotine. This includes hookah. Everybody together. This includes hookah. Okay, now just the people on this side. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but understand, so nicotine is a highly addictive substance. And nicotine is in, obviously, it's in cigarette smoke. It is in hookah pipes. It is in any method of nicotine ingestion is a form of drug addiction, okay? And obviously, we have marijuana. So this is what we commonly see with regard to substances that are highly addictive. Does anyone have questions so far? I want to make sure that we're, that we're on the same page. And I'll be happy to answer questions later. Nothing so far? Okay. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So one of the key points that I want to make is that many of the addictive drugs, including painkillers and sedatives, are prescribed by physicians, and they may be in your home. 
You know, when I was growing up, when we heard drug addiction, we were only thinking about illegal drugs. We were only thinking about things like heroin or things you would buy off of the street, like cocaine or something like that. So that's when I was growing up. But things have changed. Things have changed a lot. And one of the things that have changed is, is that the drugs that are highly addictive, the ones that are causing the most human suffering, are prescription drugs. Drugs you get from a doctor. Now certainly the illegal drugs are still a problem, but the bigger issue that we're seeing more and more in our clinic are people coming in with prescription medication problems. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what I wanna do now, and, uh, and, and Harj, please keep me updated on time. I wanna be respectful of time, so let me know when I'm running out, okay? Um, we're gonna talk about some of the characteristic behaviors that we see with people that have this problem. So one of the things that I wanna share with you is that for individuals that have drug addiction, it's just not compulsively taking a drug. It's a lot more than that. One of the biggest things, one of the biggest struggles that patients and their families have is, is that those, are the, those that are afflicted with the problem engage in very unhealthy behavior in addition to the compulsive drug use. What are those behaviors? We're gonna talk about them now. They lie, okay? There's recurrent lying, there's stealing, leaving home for no reason and giving suspicious answers when questioned. Mom, dad, I'm going out for a little while. Where are you going? I'm going to the store. What store? Oh, the store down the street. Why? Because I need stuff, okay? Appearing, oops, uh, could you go back to, the, thank you very much. Uh, appearing poorly groomed and not tending to one's personal appearance. People may appear what we call very disheveled or they're not taking care of their own personal grooming, okay? Relationship turmoil with loved ones. This is a huge one. Large amounts of money missing or asking to borrow money for suspicious reasons. And abrupt changes in school or work performance. Unfortunately, those that are struggling with the problem are not gonna come out and tell you. They're not gonna come out and say, Mom, I'm struggling with this problem. Mom, you know something? Johnny gave me some Vicodin the other day, and you know something? Something strange happened. I took it, and it did something to me. I felt something like I never felt before, and I wanted more. And now, I can't stop taking it. I would love if that's what happened and people would come in and say that, but unfortunately they don't. What happens is, is that they conceal the problem, they hide it. And one of the things we say is that they protect their relationship with the drug because they wanna deflect anyone intervening, okay? Can I have the next slide, please? So this is what I'm saying here. So they will minimize or deny the problem this is a symptom of the illness in itself. This isn't somebody that's trying to be difficult. Oftentimes, if you're suspecting somebody is actively struggling with this and you confront them with the issue, if you say, Johnny, I wanna to talk to you about it. You know, I think you're struggling with alcohol. Yes, you're right. You hit it on the head. That's absolutely what's going on. I'm so glad you talked to me. That's not gonna happen. They're gonna say you're crazy. I don't have an alcohol problem. You're the one with the problem. Okay, you're crazy for even thinking that. That's what's gonna happen. It's very common, so this is considered to be a symptom of the illness itself. And as I told you before, they will protect their relationship with the drug and they will block interventions for those that try and th those that wanna help them. What I have here is a big word. I'm saying personality metamorphosis. Basically what that means is the person changes their behaviors dramatically. The way they interact with others, the way they interact with family is dramatically changed. So again, the point that I wanna solidify by going over these last couple slides is it is not just using a drug compulsively. There are profound personality and behavioral changes that, that, that happen and are very toxic to the individual and very unhealthy for the family around them. Drug addiction does not affect an individual alone. For an individual that is struggling with this problem, it affects everybody within touch. Mother, father, spouse, brother, sister. Anybody that has a relationship with that person is going to be affected. 
This is not just something that the single person deals with. This is the one individual may struggle with the problem, but it becomes a family issue because everybody that has a relationship with that person is going to be involved. Okay? So some key points. So basically, let me kind of summarize what I talked about. Um, one of the things you need to understand is that for people, and this is probably, when I give talks like this, one of the most difficult things for people to understand is the first point that I have here. It isn't that the individual doesn't want to stop. They can't stop. And that's so hard for people who aren't afflicted with a problem to understand. It isn't, a, it isn't an issue of wanting to. It's that they can't. And that's very hard for people to understand. Asking somebody to stop or cut down without being engaged in treatment is an unrealistic expectation. Notice I have that underlined. I wonder why. Okay. Oftentimes people will say, can you just stop? Can you just stop drinking? Please stop taking Xanax. Please stop taking Vicodin. Just stop. It's not going to happen. If somebody is dealing with this problem, in order for them to stop, in order for them to cut down, they need to get involved in treatment. So it's unrealistic for us just to think that they're going to stop just because we told them to. I wish it was that simple. I really do. But unfortunately, it's not. Uh, can you go back to the other slide, please? Just the one previous. Thank you. Um, you cannot talk somebody out of the problem. The best way you can help somebody is to refer them to a professional treatment center. If you know somebody, okay, and if you guys are within earshot of me, please listen to me. If you know somebody that is struggling with this, the best thing you can do for that patient is, or, excuse me, for that person, a loved one, family member, whomever it is, please get them into a treatment center. Do not take this burden on yourself. Do not try and fix the problem. You're not going to be able to fix it. This is, this is a medical issue, and they need to be cared for by appropriately trained medical personnel. I'm going to say it again because it's important. If you know somebody that is struggling with this, please refer them or please work on getting them to an appropriate treatment center. I'll stay here a little while afterwards. If you have any questions, talk to me. We have an organization in the community that's called SAFE, S-A-F-E. One of our representatives, Ghada Abdullah, is here today. She's a clinical pharmacist working out in Gross Point. Her and I, together with many other people, we're working on a community coalition, and we're working on helping people that are struggling with this. Okay? Unfortunately, I don't have flyers, but I will try and have flyers available next week. So those of you that are here today, hopefully you can pick up flyers next week. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry. Can you go back to the previous slide? Did I finish everything there? Yes, I did. Thank you. Can we have the next slide? Okay. So when we talk about treatment, um, there are various what we call levels of treatment. Um, there's outpatient treatment, there's inpatient treatment. And one of the things we do is that when somebody says, you know something, I need help, the first thing we do is we need to assess what we call a level of care. What level of care does this person need? Um, can they just come into an outpatient clinic? Or do they need to go into an inpatient program? So there's various levels of care. So somebody can just come in, they can meet with a therapist every week, or on the more extreme end, they need to go into the hospital for a week or two. And sometimes we have something called uh, long-term residential programs. Uh, these programs can last anywhere between 30 and 90 days and sometimes longer than that, okay? Um, there's, so anyway, so just so you know, so when your loved one, if you know somebody, um, when they're coming in for an assessment, when they're coming for help, the first thing that needs to happen is, is that we need to decide what level of care does that person need, okay? There's also something called community support meetings. Uh, this is like NA or AA. How many have heard of NA or AA before? Okay, most, most people have. Uh, these are community support meetings. These are not professional treatments. Okay, these are run by individuals that have been afflicted by the illness. It is a support group. It is not treatment. Very different. I want you guys to understand that. So again, it is not treatment. It is support. Let's make a contrast. Let's say somebody has cancer. You go to your cancer doctor for treatment. You go to a cancer support group for support. Okay? It's the same thing. They are very effective and they're very helpful. Many people utilize these meetings on a daily basis. 
There are people that struggle with alcohol addiction. They've been sober for 20 years. They go to a meeting every day of their life, and they will continue to go to a meeting until the day they die. This is their lifeline. This gives them the support, and it helps them stay sober. I'm an advocate of community support meetings, such as NA and AA. I think they do a great job. But the thing I need to tell you is that if you know somebody that is struggling with either an alcohol or a drug problem, simply asking them to go to NA or AA is not going to fix the issue. It's not. It's going to give them support, but it's not going to treat the problem. Okay? Can I have the next slide? We already talked about that. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, that's it. So I think I covered everything. Um, and I don't know what the time frame is. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, if you guys have any questions to ask, questions about the presentation, or just questions in general. Anybody? Anything? I don't have my glasses on, so... Yes. What a fantastic question. Thank you for asking that. Did everybody hear that? For those of you that didn't hear it, I'm going to repeat it. Uh, the young sister asked, if you know somebody that is struggling with addiction, they're over 18, and they won't go into treatment, what do you do? Very common occurrence. We deal with this every day in our clinic. Um, it's a tough situation. I'll tell you what I do, and hopefully this will help you out. Um, understand is that this type of resistance is common. For individuals that are struggling with this, we often try and get them into treatment and they will either deny they have a problem or they will basically state that they're not in need of treatment. So what do we do? We have somebody that's struggling with what can be potentially a life-threatening issue and they're not going into treatment. So one of the things we do is that we try and get leverage. Um, what I do is that if I can't get them into treatment, I try to find somebody that can. So I will find somebody who has a close relationship with that person. Let me give an example. Let's say that you're working with a family member and they don't want to go to treatment. Who has the power to leverage that person into treatment? Often we do an ultimatum. And that ultimatum is this. First, we find somebody that has leverage. Leverage meaning is the individual that may be providing this person with shelter, money, food. And we get that person to align on the side of treatment. And that person will say to the person that's struggling, you have two choices. You either go to treatment, I love you, I help you, I will help you pay for your treatment. If you don't want to go to treatment, you need to move your stuff, you need to get out of my house. Okay? I know that's tough love. But when we're dealing with something like this, oftentimes it comes to that. The other, so that's a more severe end of it, meaning that you want to give them an, a choice, A or B. Either you go to treatment or this is going to happen. If that's not the route that wants to be taken by the family, we do have certain what we call psychotherapeutic interventions, something called motivational interviewing, where the individual will meet with the therapist, and even though on day one they may not be interested in going into treatment, the therapist will work with them and through the course of time will hopefully get them to change their perception of the issue and hopefully get them into a treatment program. So there's a spectrum. Either we can work with that patient in psychotherapy, ultimately motivate them to get into treatment, or on the other end of the spectrum is that you get family together, you, get, you, get, you have somebody that has leverage over that person, and you basically state you need to choose treatment versus this bad consequence here. It's a great question. We can, on it, we can probably talk about that for an hour. I want to thank you for bringing it up. I hope that was at least modestly helpful. Yeah, it's a really, well, 
Well, I, I think there's always help for somebody. I, I, I don't like to say that a situation is hopeless because I don't think that that's the case. I think there's always help for somebody. For that individual, maybe he or she hasn't hit the rock bottom yet. Um, sometimes people have to hit their rock bottom before they realize is that they need to get help. Um, in most cases, if A, B, and C is happening, nothing's happening, that this individual continues to engage in these behaviors, maybe going to jail is what they needed to have happen. Maybe this consequence is what they needed before they actually turn the corner. But it's hard. You know, you're talking about a very common scenario. There's a lot of different ways to handle it. The tough love thing may not work. It doesn't work in some cases, but we never give up hope, okay? Um, I want to ensure that we have time for other questions. Again, a very good, you guys are asking really, really good questions. Um, this is a big misconception. A lot of people feel that if you take a certain medicine long enough, you're going to become addicted to it. That doesn't necessarily happen. Because of somebody's, what I call their biological vulnerability or their genetics, they're what we call very highly predisposed to this problem. Let me give you an example. In the most severe cases, true story, had a lady, normal teenage life, graduated high school, went to undergrad, did really well, got a, college, got a college degree, had a dental problem. So she went to the dentist. She had to have her tooth taken out. The dentist gave her Tylenol with codeine for the pain. She took one pill, one pill of Tylenol with codeine and that triggered a life-threatening drug addiction for her. She took the one pill and she could not stop. And it's interesting when you talk to people that have such high sensitivity to this, what they tell you is, they say, the minute I took that, I knew, and this is exactly what she told me. She said, the minute I took that, I knew something was wrong. They know, because the reinforcement that the drug provides is so profound to some people. Okay, now that's an extreme example. Uh, we have examples that are less dramatic. Um, it's usually a multitude of things. It's not just one. I think you have people that have an underlying biological sensitivity to it. And if everything goes well in their life, it likely won't manifest themselves. The, the disease won't come about. But if you have somebody that has the underlying susceptibility, then you tag on a psychiatric disorder. Then you tag on social stress then you tag on financial stress, and then all these things coalesce and come together, then they get into a car accident, they break their leg, and now they're prescribed Vicodin, yes, that can trigger the illness. So to answer your question, it's a variety of factors, but the underlying theme is this, that usually people have an underlying biological sensitivity. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Oh, one more question. No? Okay. This was fun. Um, I'll hang out. I'll answer questions. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much.